Hey, how many of you uh, enjoy Nate's energy at the Level 1 Church? You bring your head up, right? He really does. And uh, if you know what Nate does, he works uh, about 80 hours a week when he does in software sales. He flies, I think he's been maybe in three different cities this week. Um, and then gets here to help prepare. It's not easy, but I just appreciate the energy that Nate brings to it and, and the energy he's bringing in that some of these young people are starting to come out to our church and it's just a good energy. And uh, Ronald Reagan said something a long time ago, how old would you be if you didn't know how old you were? I like that because we're all young at heart. And uh, so I like that and I hope you're doing well today. Um, we've got no one in the spit zone here, so I'm pretty safe right here, Tom. You're my next target, so I'll try to keep some distance from you. Take you back a little bit, all the way to the Sea of Galilee. They call it the Sea of Galilee, but the truth is it's a lake. It's a freshwater lake, but tradition calls it the Sea of Galilee. It's 13 miles long, it's 8 miles wide, and yet it can have some serious waves on this lake. I kind of picture this night where Jesus and the disciples are chilling. Matter of fact, maybe they didn't have music probably the way we do today, but if they did, maybe in a song kind of like this at the, at the time at the Sea of Galilee. Uh, it's not playing. <laughs> okay. As I said, they didn't have music back then, so maybe that one, I, pre I prefaced it with that. Um, if we get a little later on, let me know. Um, they're, just, they're just chilling by the Sea of Galilee and, I'm reflecting that night as something like this. I grew up near Lake Michigan. Lake Michigan is 307 miles long and about 118 miles wide. It's a pretty big body of water. It seems more like a sea than it does a lake. And I think more ships have gone down in the sea than the, in the lake of Lake Michigan because it's the way the waves go, it's just kind of messed up and a lot of, a lot of ships are lost. But they're sitting one night and they're just reflecting. And the disciples are hanging with Jesus and maybe it's about 10 o'clock at night the moon's reflections off the Sea of Galilee. They hear the boat kind of rocking up against the shore. And then one of the disciples just says, man, when you think about it, it's kind of crazy. That's usually probably Peter doing the talking because he was the outspoken one. And one of them said, what are you talking about, Peter? He said, well, just, just let's reflect for a little bit. What's, what's happening? And I think probably, you know, you got to remember these disciples weren't Believers, many of them, God changed their lives. They accepted the Lord and they found him. They were, if they were believers, they're very young in their faith. So he doesn't take these great theologians to change the world. He takes the simple people and get, grab, grabs them. They had probably bad habits. Their language had to improve quickly when Jesus was around. But I imagine the goal once in a while was to get Jesus to laugh. So they're probably having a night. They're kicking back. They're enjoying the, They're just. It's that perfect summer evening. And they've been having a good time. And one says, hey, do you remember the time that uh, Jesus turned the water into wine? How do, you, how do you do that? How'd you do that, Jesus? That's, that's a pretty cool miracle. And that was his first miracle. His mom, his Jewish mother kind of pushed him into that. He wasn't really expecting to do a miracle, but the Jewish mother said, have you seen what my son can do? <laughs> so she, she kind of pushed him into his first miracle, and he says, well, Mom, this wasn't what I was planning on letting this go, but here we go. And Jesus turns the water into wine. Another disciple says, yeah, I, I like that one, but I loved it when Jesus healed the, the royal official's son. He says, yeah, I like that too. How about when the guy was born blind and he had never seen a thing? And Jesus walked over. Get this one, guys. Jesus walks over and spits in the mud, grabs it, puts it on his eyes, pats it and says, now take it off and see. <laughs> this man doesn't act like a man. He acts like a child. You guys remember that? He looked like a child. I can see! I can see! Some of you are running through that thought, but I can see! He's so excited that he can finally see, and Jesus just carries on. He said, what about the time? And Jesus has the multitude. <laughs> and we got 5,000 men. 
Then we have women. Then we have children. Jesus says, yeah, bring those uh, few fish here and a few bread here, and we're going to feed 15,000 people. And the disciples are like, did you catch that? Did you catch that? And Jesus takes us and he multiplies a few fish. And he takes it and he says, uh, we're going to feed everybody. And they're just kind of reflecting. I'm going to pause just for a second. If you come to 11 on for a little while now, or you've been in this church for a while, or maybe it's been another church that you grew up in, I want you to reflect just for a second on the miracles of Jesus in your life. Some of you who are married, that's a miracle. <laughs> when my wife said yes, that was my first miracle. I'm like, really? <laughs> yes. She said, yes. Naive. Thank you. Some of you, you, some of you guys married over your heads. <laughs> Matter of fact, I think that's what draws us to this church. If you're in that club. I haven't met a lady in this church yet that's married over her head. That's political. When Jesus heals his great friend Lazarus, who died, and been in the grave, stench had already set in. And Jesus said, Lazarus, come forth. Now hang on a second. You're reading the event after that took place. You're like, doesn't Jesus know he's dead? Lazarus, come forth. And out of the grave comes Lazarus. And they're just, they're just chilling. Talking about the greatness of what Jesus Christ has done. Now listen, I've been in churches before when they've hit a real rhythm. When they've been at a point where it just seems every Sunday is a smash. Every youth event is a smash. Everything they did from Christmas parties to whatever, you just couldn't wait. The church picnic parties were amazing. Everything. The unity of the body of believers were awesome. People were getting saved and you're in that rhythm you're like, Wow! This is just great to be a part of. I think that's the feeling that's going on right now with the disciples. They're hanging out, they're chilling by the lake, they're hanging with the one and only Jesus, they're talking about the miracles that he's done. They're not trying to build Jesus up at that point, they're just taking in what they've done and seen. On top of it, it's got to draw on them a little bit that they're 11, 12 out of a lot of people on the planet that were asked to walk with Jesus. I don't always think, by the way, the disciples were humble. So there's got to be a little chest going out there. Yeah, and we were there. We were a part of it. And all of a sudden we have a sea change or a no change here that comes along in Matthew, excuse me, Mark chapter 8. And God gives them a little bit of prep. And I want to give this to you because we're going to do communion next week. My concern of communion today is that it becomes a habit or a ritual that people aren't really focused on. I'm not trying to take the negative side of that. I'm only saying this, that communion can never become old to us. God gave it to us for a reason. And he tells us in communion that, well, let's go to Mark chapter 8 and then we'll back up a little bit and see what he's talking about. He began to teach them, he's talking to his disciples here, that the Son of Man must suffer many things. And be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes, and be killed after three days and rise again. He said this openly, and Peter took him and began, he began to rebuke him. Stop, pause, and hang on for a second. This is human nature. When your church is going well and things are great in your life, we tend to want to watch now, box it in and hold it there forever. <clears throat> I was just looking at, I don't know why, but I was Paul Newman, and he was in a movie with Joanne Woodward in 1961, the year I was born. And I was with my daughter Alexa, and she said, is that the guy that's on the bottle of all the a Thousand Island and all that stuff? I said, yes, he's raised $100 million for charity. That's him? I'm like, that's all you know of Paul Newman? She goes, yeah, he's on the bottle of lemonade, too. I'm like, oh, my boy, we're getting old. But I saw a movie, and I don't even know the movie, but it was uh, Sidney Portier, Diana Carroll, and uh, it was uh, Joanne Woodward and Paul Newman. And it was overshot in Paris. He was 36 years old, because I always get curious how old they were at that point. And I said, I saw him in a great movie called Absence and Malice. I don't know if you ever saw that movie, but it was 20 years later, 
almost to the date of this movie. It was amazing how much he'd aged in 20 years. He must have got married and had children. <laughs> he, 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 he aged a lot in 20 years. And I'm looking at the age difference. And I thought, wow. You see, we would love to be able to hold on. I think about the, the if you could say, what age would I like to hold on to? Most of us would hold on to maybe the mid-30s. And we'd say, okay, 33, 35, that's a great age. You know, I'm halfway beyond my immaturity. I've still got my youth. Uh, and we might hold on to those things. But guess what? Age doesn't stop. Amen? <laughs> age continues. And you look in the mirror year after year, and you know it's the same person, but they're looking a little different year after year. Because we want to kind of hang on to this beautiful greatness. And the disciples were right in feeling that way. I mean, they saw some incredible miracles, and God did some great things for people's lives. But here's where it starts to turn. He said openly, and Peter took him aside and rebuked him. By the way, that's my second point with you today. How many, how many times do we tell God what he needs to hear from us? Don't, don't you love that we have to say, well, God, if you only knew. <laughs> a little bit of an oxymoron. If you knew the whole picture. If you could see all of it. Oops. You can. What we do sometimes is we tend to control things in our life, and we even bring that on to the Father above. And we say, God, but I, I, well, this is what I want. Peter takes Jesus aside and he begins to teach him different doctrine. Come here, Jesus, you got this one wrong. Come here. Come over here, Jesus. Come here. I love the way Jesus delicately handles Peter. He says, get behind me, Satan. <laughs> he says it openly, and Peter took him aside, but when he had turned around and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter, saying, get me behind me, Satan, for you are not mindful, watch, of the things of God, but of the things of men. <laughs> what is communion? Communion has three major aspects to it. Now I'm going to pause here just for a second to tell you that all the major NFL teams right now are so excited. They are so excited. Why? Because they're prepping. They're getting ready. Matter of fact, I think it was Cleveland that was getting ready for Matthew Stafford this year for the Lions. I read that. No one else cares. I know. I know. Why are they so excited? Because it's before them. It's before them. Not one NFL team has lost a game yet. So the coach can hype it. They can say, this is your year. New York Jets, this is your year. Washington Redskins, this is your year. Dallas Cowboys, this is your year. Detroit Lions, this is your year. Green Bay Packers, why? Because we've got it together. And they just go through it. Sometimes I think in communion we need to stop and reflect the importance of this. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, Jesus begins to teach the disciples. And he starts here by saying, look it, I'm going to be gone. I'm going to become afflicted. I'm going to become beaten. The body is going to be torn apart for three days. And then the temple will be built back up. And they're trying to figure out where he's going. And he, gets, he begins to teach them three important factors about communion. And I don't want to do it today. I want to study it today, and I want to apply it next Sunday. And I want to tell you in the game prep is this. I heard a pastor on the radio this week, and he was so profound. And John and I were looking at old cars up in Auburn, and he invited me to go with him to look at those old cars. And on my way up, I caught my Scottish pastor, Alistair Begg, on the radio, and I just got to about Auburn, John. He was in this keynote, and he was talking about the number one reason that we're on the planet. Watch us as Christians. The number one reason you're on the planet is to glorify the Father above. It's the number one reason we're here. And when we get away from that principle of glorifying the Father, we begin to search and seek for happiness and all the, because it's not what we were called to do as the children of God. We were called to glorify the Father above. Communion takes us back to that thought. Jesus knew we were human and that we're capable of getting this human thing wrong. When we get so earthly, we forget about the heavenly cause in which we're supposed to be a part of. So he sets up communion as a constant reminder of three things. And here's the reminder. He said, don't forget my body that was broken for you. Don't forget this. This really happened that I sacrificed. Does any parent go through this at all? As your kids get older, and, and, and I don't want to beat up on the millennials all the time, but there's a pretty big expectation game in the millennial uh, world today. 
But as your kid gets older and you saw your mother sacrifice them, what really hit me is Michelle went through about 24 hours of labor for Aubrey, and it was tough labor. So when Aubrey became about seven or eight and she was smarting off to her mother, God brought me back to the labor. And I said, Aubrey, do you realize the pain she was in to deliver your mouth that's running right now? <laughs> She's like, what? And I said, yeah, I mean, hard pain. The both of us. <laughs> I was there with her. And one time I fell asleep, she woke me up and said, Are you kidding me? And I said, I'm with you. And she said, ah. Oh. And as they go over, Andrea tried, Alexa tried. We've had wonderful kids, but you had to remind them of the pain that the mother endured, giving that child labor so that they could be on the planet. Sometimes we run our life and we, we run it as though we almost deserve the next breath or we almost deserve this or we almost deserve the beautiful things that we have. And Jesus says, hold up here. That's earthly, man. You didn't deserve anything. I have given you grace and blessings. And because of that, you have. Start with this, my body that was broken for you. Man, that can just never get old. That can never get old. And I remember seeing the movie, Jesus of Nazareth, and when Jesus was so cruelly beating, and I gotta be honest with you, I still don't do well with watching movies where Jesus was beaten. I, I still don't know. I'm so angry inside. I want to beat the ones who are beating him. Like Jesus couldn't have done that himself. And I love the fact they've beaten Jesus by this time. And he's going and he's, he's fallen and in the movies. He's on all hands and knees. And he's beaten and he's bloody. And Mary's afar off. And she's weeping for her son. Who's never done anything but good. And Jesus comforts her with truth. He didn't comfort her with just, just flowery thoughts. He said, woman, why did thou weepest? He said, I give this body and I take it back. I'm the resurrection and the life. That's the God that we serve. His body was beaten, was beaten for your sins. Anybody else sin in the room besides me? And he watch this. Anybody have any sins you don't want anybody to know but God? <laughs> I'm going to give you a second to all get your double hands up, okay? <laughs> double up on that one. <laughs> then you go with him and you say, God, your mercy, your grace, based on what you were beaten for. That can never get old to us. Don't take communion as though it's just another 15 minutes of a service. You grab that bread and realize this was a symbol of the body that was beaten for no good reason. All because of what he said. That they were going to afflict him, the scribes would turn on him, and they would beat him. Why? Because he was the truth. By the way, write this down. No one ever beats up anything that's not the truth. Buddha is still popular. The religions of the world, I love the bumper sticker, coexist. <clears throat> Doesn't make sense. Jesus didn't come to coexist. He said, I am the way, the truth, and life. No man comes to the Father but through me. And I will be beaten for that story. When they gathered him, and they said, are you God? He said, who do you say that I am? They said, are you God? He said, hear, O Israel, the Lord thy God is one Lord. He died for us, you guys. His body was beaten and broken for us. That can never get old. The second reason is bloodshed. The Bible says that there's no greater love than a brother who would lay down his life for another. We see kids at war right now, and they're going off. Jared, our junior high director's brother, is going to Afghanistan. Matter of fact, he's there now. He's leading a troop. Before he gets to Afghanistan, three of his soldiers are already gone. They've been killed in Afghanistan. There's a really good chance he's not coming home alive. You know, this heroism is unbelievable. This guy's 20 some years old. And he's going off to war, maybe not coming back home. These are real thoughts, these are real truths. These guys have come back with their, their dogs or animals because they've had such a bad time overseas. And their body's just been rattled by what they saw at war. Man, don't take it for granted, that kind of love. 
But in the midst of that love, let me just say this, Jesus Christ never did anything wrong. He was perfect. He was human, and he was deity, but he never did anything wrong. He was perfect. So God comes down. He is the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the most powerful being who's ever been. And he comes, watch, and he dies for you and me. And he sheds his blood. The Bible says without the shedding of blood, there's no removal of sin. He had to shed his blood. Let me ask you a question. Look around the room real quick. Look around the room. Don't look at me. Look around the room. Who would you die for right now? If someone came in the back door and said, okay, I've got one bullet, choose who I'm going to kill. It's not going to be you. You choose them. Don't point up here, guys, all at once, okay? That's an easy out. I would go with the biggest guy up in the room right there. No. Who, who would you do? Would someone step up and say, hey, forget that. Take me. I will sacrifice my bloodshed for the room. Well, you might want to think that, but then you start saying, well, what's going to happen to my grandkids? What's going to happen to my kids? What's going to happen to the one we're marrying? I'm too young to die. Jesus was at the prime of his life. He didn't want to die. He went to the garden with his father and they talked it over. And he said, Father, is there any other way but this? And Jesus said, no. God said, no. And he said, not my will, Father, but thine. His body is beaten. His body is broken. Now he's going to shed his blood. And he goes to a cross and he sheds his blood. And he's saying to Peter, get away from me, Peter. This isn't people forcing me. This is my will. The Father's will is coming to play. So Jesus goes and he literally sheds his blood that we might have eternal life. Now watch, I'm so serious about the next five minutes hang with me. It drives me crazy the amount of people that are rewriting the scripture today and telling you how people are going to get to heaven. Jesus didn't shed his blood so people could take his story and mix it up. People don't just have a better afterlife. People don't just get there because they're good. Thanks, guys. Um, yesterday, I was um, here at the church. We put an alarm system in because I have a lot of young staff, some of them young female staff, and we get transients once in a while. And it was bothering me, so I wanted to get an alarm system put in. So i got to be honest with you. On a Saturday between uh, noon and 3.30, I really don't want to be in the church. I want to be able to do something different. But it's what God called me to do yesterday, and so we got the alarm system put in. And that's a much safer situation for the people that work in our building. Um, so as that was solved on my way home, I was really kind of tired. Because I got up at 5-something to play golf. <laughs> and did that real well. Had breakfast with mom and dad, got to the church. These guys were slower than I anticipated, but we got the alarm system in. You know the alarm system guy's in trouble and he's asking me about technical things? You've got a problem. But anyway, we got it done. On my way home, going up industrial, on the 12 bridges, I see a car. It uh, looks like a mom who's maybe 45, a daughter who's 20, and about three or four kids, and they're broken down. It's coming from my heart today. I did not want to stop. I, I gave the Lord reasons why. Because I, no golfer friend showed up. He knows that. He saw that. It's accounted for. I had to be at the church. I was just getting kind of sleepy, and I was going home, and I thought, I can't do this. So I pulled over a little bit, and I go over, and I said, what's going on? She says, well, it just won't stop. And I said, is it out of gas? She goes, I don't think so. And my great expertise, I'm trying to think, what can I say? This sounds smart. You know, I don't even know what I'm talking about. She's putting antifreeze in, which didn't make much sense to me. Like, okay. Um, yeah. Do you want me to call somebody who knows what they're doing? She said, hmm, which meant I don't think she had money. The car was an older car. And I said, okay, um, hmm, okay, um, I'll pray for you and I'll be back. She said, okay. So I ran down to the store because I looked at the kids and they were literally just sweating profusely in the back of the car. Everybody looked miserable. You've been there before. I pulled into the gas station and I got 
two big things of Gatorade and some potato chips and donuts for a healthy meal. And uh, I knew the kids would love me, the parents may not, but I was going to score the kids, you know. So I got this stuff together and I got a bag of ice and uh, brought it back there. And by the time I got there, the Lincoln police were there and he was helping and everybody was running, including the Lincoln police. I kind of wheeled in the phone and looked at that being funny. And I got out of the car and bring the stuff and I said, hey, I just wanted to bring you guys some refreshments, cool the kids down. And the kids were like, yes, you know, big smile on their faces. And I uh, said, hey, I'm the pastor of 1101 Church around the corner. Anything we can do for you guys, let us know. Uh, we care about the community. We care about people like you. And here's my here's my card. And the police officer, dude, that was just flat out cool. Now, why I'm telling you that is because you make that possible at a level in church. I knew that we had enough in the account to do that, and I knew this was nothing I was doing. God led me to do it. I would have done it on my own. Point is this: I was thinking about the sacrifice Jesus did for me, and I'm thinking, what a little baby, Tim! You're tired up on Saturday at three o'clock. Get over it. Get it done. Now, I don't know what will happen. My prayer that goes way beyond Gabriel, my prayer that goes on to the gospel of Jesus Christ and touches a life, their lives change. How many more people in the community need our love? You see, when you know that it's really connected with you, when Jesus' body that was broken and his blood shed that was shed, he's saying what really connects is you'll never get over the mission. You won't forget why you're here. Don't let all the earthly things take away your mission, that I died for you, that I shed my blood for you, now you have a chance to do the same thing. You die to self and you do things for others and you live the Christian life. That's what communion is about. It's a reminder of the forgiveness that I get in Christ. It's a reminder of the desire I have in Christ. And thirdly, the third reason is this. He said, celebrate this together until I come back. I've been involved with really three great churches. The one that I grew up in, the one that I pastored in Michigan for 10 years, and this one that I've been at a long time as well. I've been thrilled to be a part of those churches and get to know those people. The memories sometimes as we kick back and just see it, it is funny. I have, I have one memory that sticks off my mind when we did a kid's day, and I wanted this huge banner up there when people pulled in, but it was like way up on, a, on one of the softball diamonds at the school, and the, the, the thing was like this. It wasn't... And I had a goofy youth pastor, you may remember me, Matt, Matt Wyatt, remember that name at all? And I go, man, I, I just wish we could, uh, wish we could get that up there. He said, what's that, Skipper? And Skipper was not a, a nice term. He was calling me the Skipper from Gilligan's Island. So it wasn't like he was being respectful. Okay. And I said, Gilligan, you think there's any shot of you getting up there? And he goes, say it again. Say it to my face. And I said, I want that man up there. Oh, I should have never said it. I mean, those goofy legs were all over this thing. The whole thing was going like this. And he got up there. He's like, like this, Pastor? And I was like, man, get down. And the banner was up there, and people came in, and they thought, oh, that's so clever. How did you do that? And you think of just the simplest of times that you did. I think of some of the men's group when we eat the healthy wings that we do when we get together. Talk about the Lord. I think when I see things like this morning, the kids... Some of the golf outings where people actually show up and golf with you. Those were memories. <laughs> I can think of the, the pajama party. They kicked me out of at my house when they had 30 women in the church doing the pajama party at the Christmas time. And so Shell said, come back at midnight. We'll be done by then. <coughs> you remember the memories of the people who have come to Christ. And they found the Lord through this ministry. And you realize that's an eternal difference in someone's life. I just think some of the praise services we have are really unique. I told the Lord a long time ago my desire in our praise and worship would be that we'd have three different types of worship. That on Saturday nights it would be called relax. Or you could even have Mountain Dew and popcorn and just worship God and keep it kind of chilled. And my goal for that was kind of a jazzy, chilled out type of event. I called uh, recently Shay and said, Shay, any of your Saturday nights available if we kick this thing off in the fall? She goes, yeah, here they are. Gave me about six or seven nights that she could come on Saturday nights and kind of kick that service off. My other vision was maybe kind of a nine o'clock service that would be a little more traditional where some of the more hymns were brought in because they still moved me a lot. And then 11 o'clock was called Revved Up where there were no rules other than to glorify God. You can get as loud as you possibly might and break some windows. 
There's no rules. Why? Because there's two other services you can go to if you don't like that one. We're not quite there yet, but I see how God's hand is in doing those type of things, and I just get humbled by it. It was just a thought that I had that God gave me. You see, celebrate what God's doing here. Here's why. Because things will change. We can't always keep it the same. Start to celebrate the work of God. Start to celebrate the people of God. When you see a new face, take the time to do that. Say, hey, I've never gone to lunch with you. You want to go to lunch? Buy, buy me lunch? Or go to lunch with me and hang out? Get to know people and do lunch with them. Don't be afraid of each other. Celebrate one another. Here's one. I'm closing with this today. I guess we'll put it up with that back. It's all do. <laughs> when you never get over what Jesus has done for you, that's a great place to start. Never get over that because no one else would have done what he did. When you've accepted him as your personal savior, you realize that you're going to be with him forever. And then thirdly, he didn't put this in there just to kind of slip it in the last minute. Hey, by the way, you might want to celebrate with each other. He said, remember this till I come back. Matter of fact, they did it this way in the communion days of back then. They had a big feast. And they ate together before communion. And they were together and they celebrated what they were about to do. And it wasn't just a face in the church, it was a relationship. I got with a gal this week and she told me why she wouldn't come to the church. <clears throat> she said, I go to a church that you celebrate who you're sitting next to. I said, okay. She said, you celebrate it if they're a drug addict. You celebrate it if they're a prostitute. You celebrate it if they're a pastor. You celebrate it if it's a cop. It doesn't matter. You celebrate around the people you're around. Not just your friends. That's pretty cool. I said, so why won't you come to this church? You didn't like my preaching? She says, okay. I said, you like the music? She was better than your preaching. So you wouldn't come to the church? I'd come. I'd come to the church. It's okay. Have you ever thought about bringing what you just said to this church? Teaching us how to be better at that? Not judging anybody that comes through the door? Sitting next to them and celebrating with them? She said, I never thought of it that way. I said, I think you're supposed to uh, be a part of this church. And I think you're supposed to bring that kind of spirit in here. Where we can celebrate one with the other. I'll tell you a quick story we got to go for the day. I remember when I was a little kid, and we lived in the rural part of Michigan, raised in Grand Rapids, Michigan, in the rural part of Michigan. And I remember all of a sudden these hippies coming in the back door. And when they came in, I thought, oh, man, it's the Manson family. <laughs> it was back in those days when Charles Manson had done his thing, you know. And these hippies came in, and they didn't look like they had a shower for a long time. And they walked in, and they came up, and they sat. And, you know, everybody looked like either Jesus or the disciples back then when they had the long hair. And uh, they kind of sat there, and I'm, I'm just freaking out. I'm a little country kid watching these hippie dudes come into the church, and they're kind of sitting there. And of course, they got across their legs and act like hippies and stuff. And they're there for a couple weeks, and all of a sudden, uh, I see them come forward and get saved. My dad had altar calls back then, invited them in, and these hippies came up and they got saved. And I'm a little kid watching this thing. That's the weirdest people I've ever seen get saved. They came to Jesus, and it wasn't more than a couple months that some of their hair started to get cut. And, they looked a little more like the rest of us. Some of them didn't. They kept their hair that way. But you could see Jesus changing their life. You could see Jesus came in and really did a transformation. Many of them went off to Bible school. Some of them became pastors. They didn't look like me. I kind of prejudged them. God didn't. He saw their heart. Who's going to walk in this church that doesn't look like us, but needs God the way we have? I would encourage us to celebrate what God's doing right now. One last thought, and we're going to be gone for the day. I got a note this week from a lady that I don't even remember her face. It's been so long ago. She said, I heard Pastor Tim preach at an Amway meeting, an Amway convention. They invited him to speak, and I accepted Jesus that day at that Amway convention 25 years ago. I then drove an hour one way every week to hear him preach. I don't know, but there had to be some better preaching along the way, but she drove and she drove one way, and then she went back. She said, I did that for six years, and then Pastor Tim got the bright idea of going to California. And then he moved out to California, and he's been out there. And she said, I'm just going to tell you, 
Our church has never been the same since she left PT, and she said, not just because of you, there was just a special energy that was going on at that time with God. And she was like, I've just never found that again. What are you saying? It's not about Tim. Trust me. When God is bringing joy to your life and your church ministry, don't take it for granted. Celebrate. Celebrate. Don't take it for granted. And what I mean by that is that you need to build on it. Inclusively invite other people to be a part of that celebration. Celebrate together what Jesus Christ has done. Celebrate together what we can do together if we don't lose track of this. When we approach Gideon in the next few weeks, you'll realize that the people of Israel went up and down in their following God. And every time they followed God, they were blessed. And every time they started getting their mind on themselves, they were cursed. I just really, really want to encourage us never to take for granted what God is doing and what he will do in our life if we trust in the miracles of God and what he did for us in Calvary's cross. Come back next week. We're going to take the time to do communion with you. It's going to be a wonderful time. I'm going to ask that every head is bowed and every eye is closed. <clears throat> As you're searching today, communion will just be a ritual if you don't understand its purpose. Jesus died, shed his blood, and rose again that you might have eternal life. You don't have to get saved over and over again because he died once for you and you have to come to him one time. But if you've never accepted Jesus as your Savior and his sacrifice, I want to invite you to be able to do that today. The Bible says that whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ shall be saved, delivered, changed, based on what he did on Calvary's cross. If you've never accepted Jesus as your Savior, but you know you have a need for that, as all people do. You simply pray a prayer in the quietness of your heart as I pray aloud. Dear Jesus, I invite you in as my Lord, my Savior, and my friend. Pour your love inside of me right now. I accept you as my Savior. I ask forgiveness for my sins. Thank you for dying on Calvary's cross, shedding your blood, rising three days later, that I might have eternal life. Thank you for the miracle of my life today. I accept you as my Savior. If you did that today, no one's looking around. I'll pray for you in my office this week and get to know you better. Has anyone like that today? You accepted Jesus just today. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word and your truth. We thank you for the miracles of the past. But God, may we never, ever become unprepared for communion of what you've done for us. Thank you for all you've done. From your body that was broken, to your bloodshed, to your resurrection that brings the gospel to light and to the celebration of the saints who get to live together in harmony as we serve others and serve you. God, we pray that we would impact our lives today in such a way that we would never, never forget and celebrate who we're with this moment. We love you, Lord. We love each other. In your name we pray. Amen.